We're talking today to Ray Young, who is author of the book, A Time of Departing. And the subject is something unusual. It's called contemplative prayer, which seems to be roaring through evangelical churches nowadays. The question is, what is it, and why should it be of any concern? And Ray, you know, contemplative prayer has been in a lot of the liturgical churches for decades now, as a matter of fact. We, we talk about the Catholic Church, the Episcopalian Church. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the Orthodox churches have had it or oh, not. Oh, yes, yes. But why is this of any concern? I mean, why is prayer wrong, and, and then what does contemplative prayer mean? Well, for 10 years, that term put me off. I thought it meant just to think while you pray. You know, you pray a little bit, then right. you think, because, you know, in our society, the word contemplative traditionally is meant to think deeply, right? Well, then I found out it had the exact opposite meaning, that it means to switch off the mind, and then the soul contemplates God. Actually, it's using sacred words or phrases repeated over and over again to put one in an altered state of consciousness. Which sounds a lot like a mantra. Yeah, to go into the silence. Now, a lot of people may say, in fact, uh, people that don't agree, me, agree with me would say that, well, uh, this isn't a mantra because this is Christian. You know, to, for it to be a mantra, you have to use Eastern words. You know, this isn't a, a prayer to Buddha or Krishna. This is a prayer to Jesus Christ. You know, this is supposed to put you in touch with intimacy with Jesus Christ. But uh, when, you, when you research this, you find out that um, this isn't the case, that people that promote this in the Christian context actually use, you know, the term mantra and identify it with uh, the same usage in other, other traditions. This is an article from Newsweek magazine on prayer. And it says that um, emptying the mind through repetition of prayer have been the practices of mystics in all the great world religions. And they form the basis on which most modern spiritual directors guide those who want to draw closer to God. Not some, but most. In other words, emptying the mind through repetition, that's basically what a mantra is. It doesn't have to be a Hindu word or a Buddhist word or a Muslim word. It can be any word with a religious context. Where did this come from? Because we're seeing a lot of issues in the church today that are what I call, they have a patina of Christianity on the surface. But if you look down, the driving philosophy, the driving worldview or religion really didn't originate in Christianity. It's just right. been transported over and then have some Christian words and scripture thrown on the top. So where did this whole contemplative prayer movement originate? Well, it originated with a group called the Desert Fathers. Um, you don't find it anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, uh, contemplatives will quote a verse from Psalm saying, be still and know that I am God. But that has to do more with trusting God in times of crises rather than emptying the mind. Uh, on the surface, it sounds like, you know, be still, you know, in other words, meditate or, you know, be silent. But uh, that's not the connotation, you know. Uh, um, it doesn't have a mystical connotation. Well, the Desert Fathers were these group, uh, was a group of uh, monks who lived in the deserts of North Africa and the Middle East during the early Middle Ages. And according to Gerald May, who's one of the, who was one of the major proponents of contemplative prayer, this is, uh, this is what he has to say. He talks about reciting of mantras, which are sacred syllables or phrases re repeated silently or aloud, were evident in Hindu practices thousands of years ago and also an integral part of Buddhist spirituality. And also Islamic Sufism practiced the reciting of the names of God. He says, I will speak primarily of the Christian version because it is what I know best. And he says that, you know, this was, uh, uh, this was beginning in the early days of the Christian desert mystics. They wanted a way of, you know, when you're out in the desert, you want a way of being consciously in contact with God, just normal praying, you know, uh, gets old after a while. So it says that they struggled for years to keep their hearts centered in God, and they discovered practical ways of helping this happen. So they experimented. They discovered mantra meditation as a way of um, connecting with God. So this Christian mantra type prayer became a staple of the uh, monastic system beginning in the early Middle Ages, and then it was brought down all through the century, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart, uh, Julian of Norwich. And next we'll get into uh, how it's manifested in our own time. When a mantra is used in Eastern mysticism, the goal of the mantra is to actually get the mind into an altered state of consciousness, yes. into an alpha state is what yes. they call it, because the brain waves actually change mm -hmm. and they can be measured. Uh, this is significantly different 
than Western mysticism, uh, and maybe that's the question, like how did these two ultimately blend? And there was also the New Age movement, which really turned out to be more than a movement. It was a whole different paradigm shift mm -hmm. in Western thinking. And I guess one name that always comes to me is Thomas Merton, because mm -hmm. he was an early on proponent of Trappist Monk, uh, who died in 1968, and he was an early on proponent of this type of meditation. Thomas Merton is the, probably the major figure, the major icon in the contemplative prayer movement. Uh, most books on, if not all books on contemplative prayer will make some reference to him or a quote by him. Right. You know the old saying that one uh, picture is worth a thousand words? Right. Well, I have a, a picture to share with you here. This uh, is uh, uh, from uh, Vancouver School of Theology. This is a, um, se a seminary that trains pastors up in Vancouver, British Columbia. They have a Thomas Merton reading room. And in that room is this. There's a portrait of uh, or maybe even a, a painting or a photograph of Thomas Merton on the wall, and right below it is a, a statue of Buddha. Now, well, we're, we're, but Thomas Merton made that journey. If you read his his uh, autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, he talks about his own journey from sort of a, 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 a secular life, where it was pretty much of a wanton life, into a Trappist monastery in Kentucky, as I recall. Yes. Uh, and then from there, he began a migration, and this was probably during World War II, post, immediate post-World War II time, to links with uh, Eastern mysticism. Yes. As a matter of fact, he died in Thailand. He was over there for a conference yeah, when he was or, uh, electrocuted. electrocuted. Yeah. yeah, electrocuted. In the bathroom, right. Well, uh, anyhow, this is a book called Thomas Merton, My Brother, which is written by uh, Basil Pennington, who's, uh, who was a major proponent of... Uh, a contemplator centering prayer it was called in fact he wrote a book called centering prayer and right. sold over a million copies and he was talking about that at their monastery they did a zen retreat and he said i don't think such an event could have taken place if merton had not courageously shown us the way to open to the east hence this picture and over here he says merton did come to south asia india as a pilgrim you know not as an evangelist but as a pilgrim to the origins of other great spiritual traditions expressed in Shiva, that's Hinduism, right. and Buddha, which of course is Buddhism. Well, let me ask you, John, what treasures would Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim religion have for the spiritual life of a Christian? Could you answer that? Well, they would say, I mean, I know what their answer would be in, in terms of the fact that most religions are alike, and therefore there are certain spiritual values of each religion, which... Well, we're not know, talking they, about uh, virtues, though. We're not talking about things like kindness. We're talking about what he meant was spiritual perceptions. Right. Like he said, our souls are the... Uh, now and said, our, our, our Nguyen would say, our souls are those sacred centers where all is one. And prayer is where we can come to the re realization of the unity of all that is. Right, but that's, that's Eastern mysticism mm -hmm. with Christian, yeah, Christian sounding stuff on top of it. Yeah, probably the, from my perspective, the most uh, intriguing representative of this type of spirituality would be a woman named Sue Monk Kidd. Uh, she's, uh, she's probably uh, the poster girl uh, for why we're doing this DVD here. She was a Southern Baptist uh, Sunday school teacher in a small town in South Carolina. She um, um, was just a typical normal Christian, um, a wife, a mother, you know, nothing eccentric about her, nothing offbeat. Is there anything such as a normal Christian? That's yes. Right. <laughs> so uh, somebody handed her a book by Thomas Merton in her Sunday school class. Uh -huh. And she, um, she started to get into... Uh, Contemplative Prayer, and this is what she uh, this is what she wrote. This is a book she did called God's Joyful Surprise. This came out probably in the late 80s, and she talked about uh, it was the books I was continuing to discover that introduced me to the kind of prayer I was looking for. And she talked about uh, ways of being with God and uh, practices that opened the door to oneness with Him. And she said they called it contemplation. And she said how she was amazed that she didn't know anything about this ancient and powerful tradition in Christian, you know, Christian history. Right. And she says, I was ready. And in this book, you know, she talks about how she, she actually used mantras. There's a number of words she used. She would repeat over and over again, and she would go into the alpha state or the thoughtless state. Well, this book uh, was endorsed by, uh, it's defunct now, but there used to be a magazine called Virtue. You remember that? Mm -hmm. I do. 
And uh, this was Virtue Magazine's best book of the year. Okay, it was also endorsed by today's Christian woman who said that uh, the message and challenge of the book is profound. If you ever wondered if your spiritual life needed some deepening, this book will awaken your longing and set you off on your own spiritual journey. Okay, today's Christian woman. Okay, this one says, suggests some disciplines for cultivating an interior quietness and a richer personal experience of God's love. That's Moody Monthly. So this book was endorsed by all, you know, all the heavy hitters in the mainstream evangelical media. Well, that was the late 80s. In the mid-90s, Sue Monk Kidd came out with uh, her third book called The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. And, it's, and the subtitle is A Woman's Journey from Christian Tradition, that's conservative evangelical Christianity, to the sacred feminine. Now she worships the goddess Sophia. Yeah. Sophia being the goddess wisdom. Yes. Right. And now she says that, um, uh, quotes Teilhard de Chardin, you're familiar with him. Right, and his Jesuit priest. God in everything view. And she says that, uh, you know, that uh, this mystical awakening and all the great religious traditions uh, uh, in Zen, it's known as Samadhi and the divine is one. And she says, for those who go deep into spiritual practice, that's contemplative prayer, at some moment the veil slips away and you see what is. And everything that it, that is has a spiritual essence. Goddess offers us the holiness of everything. The holiness of everything. Well, of everything, that means Satan is holy, right? There's, uh, the, the golden calf was holy. And you know, all these uh, uh, pagan religions that one finds in the Old Testament were holy. Right. It, it resembles a lot uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and self-actualization that, that uh, came out of psychology. Well, theoretically, Adolf Hitler was self-actualized, so yeah. he was fulfilled. You know? So, so uh, you know, all these uh, Moody Monthly was endorsing this book, saying that you know this woman really has the the answer to your spiritual dryness. Today's Christian woman, Virtue Magazine. And she discovered this contemplative tradition. Well, where it led her was the sacred feminine, you know, the goddess. And, and there's a, a section in here where she's in her Baptist church, during Southern Baptist church during this transition. And the pastor is holding up the Bible saying, this is our sole and ultimate authority. And she gets this, this sensation of something rippling within her. And it's just spreading out. And, and uh, she says she never had such a profound... Uh, uh, feeling is what she was going through and this voice kept saying no 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 my final and ultimate authority is the divine voice in my own soul period why is all of this important I mean why should Christians be concerned try to drag that together for people you know from what I've uh, been able to uh, discover about this movement people that do it do not go in a conservative uh, route they go toward an interspiritual route. They don't go in the right direction. In other words, it doesn't lead them to the scripture. No, it doesn't it lead them, them to else. being evangelists for Jesus Christ. It leads them to embrace other religions. All right, any closing thoughts? Yes, basi that's basically it. That, uh, you know, I would, uh, I believe that we're seeing Bible prophecy unfold and that people need to uh, wake up and they need to uh, d decide what camp they're gonna be in. Matthew 24, Jesus says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and you'll receive many. That word, and many, there in the Greek is paulus, which means a sore number. And now we're seeing with, and on Oprah Winfrey with Eckhart Tolle and people like that, that uh, if you have the Christ consciousness, which is being one of your higher self, that makes you a Christ. And that Jesus was a model for Christ consciousness. 28 million people downloaded uh, the thing that uh, Oprah and Eckhart Tolle did on the Internet. 28 million downloaded it. So we're, we're talking about a mass movement. And in that 10-week uh, series, you know, the, the, uh, the, the gist of it was that Jesus modeled the Christ consciousness, and now we need to get the Christ consciousness also, which would make us a Christ just like him. Right. And that's what Jesus warned of. Many right. shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Uh, Paulus, which means a sore number, like millions and millions and millions. Right. 